Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Act Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head. And in this episode, I've got Handy Spelling on, who is Maggie Suter and Sally Ashcroft. Handy Spelling is a stationary system as well as training resources that uses uh, images to help people learn how to spell and their grammar. Sally teaches spelling as well as coaches teachers, or Maggie teaches communication design. I will put links to Handy Spelling and other things we talk about in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show, the two of you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. No problem at all. I thought I'd start off really at the beginning and how did the two of you meet? Ah, well, as mothers of dyslexic boys, (laughs) (laughs) standing at the gate when they're 11, um, slightly worried. (laughs) <laughs> sharing our, our woes so did both your children are similar age and got statement to dyslexia at the same time yeah yeah exactly we both have three children it was the youngest in each case that that, uh, that we kept that brought us together um but i've got two older ones who are also dyslexic so i was awash with dyslexia you, yeah, you had the full set by the sounds of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Maggie, you say all three of your kids are dyslexic. Mm. How are you finding the three of them? Are they all the same? Obviously no. not the same age, but how are they no. treating dyslexia differently as they walk very through their lives? Different, very different. I mean, the eldest is, um, well, he's now 28. Um, he was the person in school who was always uh, chatty. Um, I was told parent meetings were always a bit of a nightmare because he didn't concentrate, he didn't this, he didn't that. Mm. <laughs> Very articulate um, and not obviously dyslexic, actually. He learned to read quite quickly. His spelling was really good. Um, but it was only actually for him because I didn't know anything about it. There isn't dyslexia on my side of the family. So um, when it came to GCSEs for him, he got kind of very average grades. And it was only when he went to sixth form, he went to a different school, actually, and they thought, what's going on here with this guy? And they assessed him and there he was. He was dyslexic. Ah. So only really for him, you know, worked out when he was 17. He works in the creative industry. He is a very ideas-based visual person. So his skills are very suited to what he does. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and 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 it's worked out brilliantly for him, to be honest. Um, the middle one, very traditional kind of dyslexic, struggled at school from a very, very early age. Well, actually, he didn't crawl. Uh, he struggled to speak. He didn't meet those kind of, at two, you should be saying this many words. So that I, I was sort of, you know, thinking, what's going on here? I was told there was probably something wrong with his hearing when he was three, um, and it was actually his, processing at six and a half I think he was assessed as dyslexic and then it sort of you know went from there he actually went on to uh, study history and did manage to get first which was yeah he's um you know he's got that dyslexia resilience you know where he just he just works hard and just keeps going and for him I would say that you can just see that dyslexia is is for life, actually. (laughs) You know, there's that whole thing, which is great right now where everyone's talking about your superpower, you know, that you, you know, which is all kind of good. But actually the reality for him in the classroom was it didn't feel like a superpower. It affected his self-esteem. He was, it felt the, the exact opposite. And I suppose it's the thing that kind of, you know, it's the thinking behind handy spelling, which is to be able to give kids something that's quiet but supportive, that doesn't make a big show. It's something that you can hold in your hand, that you can, you know, just so that you need that little prompt. Anyway, so he's, um, for me, I would say typically dyslexic, and then <laughs> the younger one is dyslexic and dyspraxic. Woo! Ah. <laughs> and- <laughs> just to throw a slight curveball in at the end. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. So um, it's been a really interesting journey. <laughs> <laughs> Did you start noticing dyslexic traits in the younger two after you knew the eldest? No, no, no. no. It's more because there's only three years between the first and second. So it was more that the, the bells were ringing on, on the second one. Because mm. he was obviously, he couldn't read, he couldn't this, he couldn't that. 
Um, so it was more kind of obvious there. And, and off the back of it, because I didn't know anything, I just kind of went and did the Hornsby course, which was run by Dyslexia Action. Uh, just okay. to kind of, my intention was actually just to find out what this is and how do I work with them? Because they were always given extra stuff to do, um, you know, like this kind of load of work. <laughs> and yeah. um, how do you make it manageable? How do you make it interesting? How do you make it memorable? And, and off the back of that, I, I, I was able to do some one-to-one teaching. So I used to work with dyslexic kids in a, in a local school. But I also, um, because I teach communication design to degree students, you know, there's a kind of crossover with making things memorable, hopefully, um, communicating something clearly. So the th- skills that I used in that part of my life, I kind of tied them into dyslexia. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I've got a vision of two you stood outside school gates, leaves playing around. How the hell yeah. did, did you work? <laughs> it would be September. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. It just that's what school gates look like to me in my brain. Um, yeah, 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 black yeah, fence and all that kind of stuff. How did the two of you work out? Like you just stood there comparing notes one day, and they're like, "Mine does that. Mine does that." Or, <laughs> or you both stood there after school, realizing you're picking your children up later because they're at some extra dyslexia thing. I'm just really curious how you managed to work it out that both your children were dyslexic. To be honest, I had actually heard of Sally. <laughs> <laughs> The infamous so, there, Sally, because, please. Because Sally, Sally is a renowned dyslexia tutor. And oh. um, because I'd started to work in this local school with these dyslexic children, I know a lot of them had a tuition outside school. And I knew it was Sally Ashcroft. I'd heard, oh, so and so's going yes, to Sally I knew Ashcroft. that. Did I know that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so and going to Sally Ashcroft. So when we first started talking, you said you were Sally. And, uh, and, and I knew from our sons that, the surname was Ashcroft. So I sort of went, this world is more. This world is more. Well, I remember I this. Um, Maggie <laughs> told me, we our, friend, our kids got on really well and so we sort of had the odd coffee and stuff. And I remember Maggie saying to me that she'd been on a trip somewhere and I probably should remember where. And she'd had a really <laughs> lovely day at a pencil museum. And oh, I thought, oh, hello. That's... <laughs> She's a woman after my own heart because of <laughs> your interest. Yeah. Um, and so it, I think it's sort of, you know, it's a bit of a one of those organic things that I have felt for a long time, you know, that it takes such a, a long time to teach children the, the top 80, then 160, then 240 comma high frequency words. And it, if the child's not quite ready, um, because they can't hear the letters in the word, you know, because English is such a strange, awful language, they can just carry on misspelling things for quite a long time. And it's really obvious to their friends who then, because they don't really think what's going on, you know, not with any meanness in mind, might go, how can you possibly have spelt here wrong or once upon a time you know how can you spell that stuff wrong and then the children that I was working with you know they they then want to write very little because Mm, they mm. see writing as this very exposing thing where any minute now they might have spelt something wrong and make themselves very obvious to other people um and they don't know which one it is because they look at it and go, it looks okay to me, I'm not sure. <laughs> and so, you know, we thought that um, one of the very basic things we could do was, as Maggie said earlier, you know, in a very subtle way, just design some really fun um illustrated stationery that they would have anyway nobody would really know apart from they it's all in alphabetical order you know they can just in their hand just look up and go oh god that's how you spell upon it's you know it's a u instead of an a which everybody always puts um and of course then you also have like the um b's and d's which are it's a very classic thing, but it mm-hmm. is something that bugs people at early ages of, of literacy as well. So we just, we we had quite a lot of fun, actually. We were thinking about, you know, um, shoe, what were they called, Maggie, insoles at one point we were going to do. And then we then we had a summer camp and we were looking at the kids love those sort of um, tattoos, you know, that semi-permanent tattoos or not yes. so, in, whatever, what do you call them, like impermanent tattoos or something. Um, so we just... We tried to, we, we actually, for a couple of years, 
with our knowledge of working with dyslexia children, we we thought of how could we help this kid? And then we, we made um, prototypes and used them in the lessons to see how the children would get on with them. You know, and the feedback was just like one of like relief. You know, I don't, I can't remember those words, but I can just find it really easily. So that it, it was quite a long process actually, wasn't it, Maggie? We didn't, yeah. We, yeah. we, we just sort of did it bit by bit I mean, um, and tested it and tested the colours. And, you know, we, we, we believe very much in structure, um, that that really helps the sets of children rather than the sort of crazy, colourful, you know, that's cool, but not actually for learning. I think that just creates more confusion. So we just wanted to be very systematic and very simple and, and just really hone down what, what was needed for those early early years so yeah it was just it was something that seemed like a glaringly obvious hole in the market to be honest (laughs) and we were really worried that everybody was going to um copy us because you know children write every day and need notebooks and all of the rulers and all the other stuff that we do um and dyslexic children really I mean the, I mean Maggie's idea was the ruler with the days of the week and the months of the year I mean you know they have to do that every single day probably multiple times on every single day and you know as a mother of a dyslexic boy I I was very um I was really sad I mean lots of dyslexic parents are a bit and more able to deal with it. But I, I just hated the idea of him being in class and spelling Tuesday wrong or, you know, Wednesday, yeah. Monday, all of these days wrong every day and putting it at the top of his page and all of his friends seeing that. I, I was sort of, I just wondered what it, it would lead to. I didn't want him to be mocked and I didn't want him to be feeling like he was different because he missed out, you know, an E in Tuesday. And it, it, it as adults it's not you know spelling's not important nowadays you know we can use spell check and god knows what else but I think in the classroom it still remains like a really um clear division of those who can spell and who can't I think it's one of the few things that you will have marks on your spelling in other subjects where you don't have marks on your ability to do other subjects in your English lessons. <laughs> it's kind of telling how much weight you put on it. Obviously, you're mentioning handy spelling there with designing all the pens and pencils and stuff. I'm interested in that. I kind of want to park handy spelling for a minute and just come back to your sort of background before you dive into that. So apparently your infamous Sally is being a dyslexic tutor. How did that kick off, first of all? <laughs> The same really as loads of parents. You know, my my son was diagnosed. My youngest son actually was diagnosed. My mum and dad are both dyslexic. My sister's dyslexic. You know, so I had actually been very um, aware of dyslexia my whole life. I remember, you know, back in the 70s, my sister was one of the test case for uh, the first educational psychologist report. And in those days, they were like three tomes, or in my imagination anyway, they were three tomes thick. And my mum, I remember she took it into our rather, the sort of snooty headmaster and she said oh look this explains my daughter's learning and and he threw it back at her and he oh. said in my day we called it bone idol oh, and I just remember dear. my mom and my you know my being really really devastated by it and I had to do my sister's homework and you know I had to really help her the whole time because nobody made any allowances nobody recognized any you know she's smarter than I am but she she just couldn't spell and um so I ended up just stepping in so basically I was always really interested and then when my own son was diagnosed like lots of parents Mm. I did as many courses as I could um and I really loved the course and um I was lucky enough to be invited to do the masters and then I just happened to choose spelling because I thought that that was a little bit undercooked as a subject and that thing well, in, term, in, the, in terms of um, how to teach spelling, it's yeah, under, yeah. there's quite a lot of academic um, knowledge about why people spell wrong and the morphology, but how to make spelling memorable was something that um, is still not brilliantly systemized, if you like. Um, and I just happened to do that for my thesis and that went down quite well. And so um, I made you know given that my spelling's not the best um i thought i would try and make spelling rules as funky as possible um and so 
did that in some clubs and taught teachers how to make it a bit more, you know, less dry and create characters related to the different spelling rules and things like that. And then that led me very, very seamlessly into handy spelling, you know, making it um, interesting and, and, and understandable. Yes, because obviously for the benefit of audio, um, handy spelling has is quite a lot of stationery. You have your character handy, which looks like a basically a white gloved hand. Um, it reminds me of Sonic the Hedgehog's hands, if, if that was any of the design inspiration. <laughs> you have to ask the designer. I hadn't, that's not yeah. my generation, but possibly. <laughs> Because I guess with the communication design background, Maggie, that was kind of you. Would that have been your idea with the, the graphics that go along with the words? Um, yeah, it was a pretty organic process. We talked it through a lot. I suppose I refined it and developed it. Yeah, I mean, I was originally a graphic designer. Mm. Then I worked as an art director in advertising. So, you know, I've been trained in uh, making it sticky, make it. You know, how do you about your target audience? It's about how do you get them and where do you put the information so that it's yeah. memorable. So, you know, and, and that tied in with just that kind of whole idea of trying to help those kids. I just, you know, you know how it is. I, I don't know. How, you know, you're at school and you're put on the different table. Yep. Yep. You're. It's all of that stuff. That kind of feeling of other. And and if you can have something, something that just like is a little quiet, it's like having your mum in your pencil case just to sort of say, look, here you go. It's a, <laughs> spell it like that. This is how it is. Do you know, just so that that little bit of support is support, mm. you know. And um, I don't know. It, it, I tell you what, if handy, oh, I know you don't want to hear about handy spelling all the time, but if it had been around <laughs> when my kids were going through it, I would have just loved it because I just feel that, you know, anyway, so a background in communication design is very useful and it's yes. just about bringing information to an audience in a place where they can access it. And how are you finding the response to it? Because I quite like Handy's obviously doing the right action for whatever word it is. I was looking at it mm. and there's one, there's one called Witch and it's the witch that flies around on a broomstick um, yeah. or is from Wicked. And it's got wearing the witch's hat. And I remember a teacher, how I learned which witch is which, which is e easiest to say really, <laughs> is that they drew yeah. the hat on the T and the one with the T is yeah. that type of witch. Yeah. Are you finding that they are using the stationary and almost doing a look and copy thing or are they slowly after a while re retaining the image and then visually sort of how could I put this They've almost got an image in their head of the action that Handy's doing and the mm. word and they can yeah. spell it without even if they're holding a regular piece of stationery well I yeah. think the images really help with the understanding of the homophone words particularly mm. so you know I think kids get quite confused which spelling I mean they, they absolutely we as we know dyslexic children are as smart as any other children they absolutely get the idea of homophones what they don't get is which label which spelling goes with which one of them and so I think initially it's actually they are just looking and you have this sort of repetition of getting it right. And mm. after so many repetitions, rather than what you're explaining there about, you know, oh, that image will suggest them uh, this picture. But, I mean, different children respond in, in different ways. What's something that happens almost on a daily basis with me is that a smart, imaginative child who really likes creating stories or characters or, you know, they don't want to write and not writing is such a, a, it really slows you down. You know, you, mm. you miss a lot of learning opportunities if you don't write, make all those mistakes that, you know, make mistakes with syntax, mistakes with grammar and all of that stuff that you have to make those mistakes in order to progress. And if your overriding ambition is to write as little as possible so <laughs> you can't spell anything wrong. Uh, you I used to have are, that ambition, yeah. <laughs> yes, I know. I mean, you know, I've, I've seen kids who like, you ask them to talk about their dog and they like go off on a, this amazing, you know, description of their dog. And then you write it down and it's, you know, my dog is nice. And, yeah. uh, you know, it that's is black what, with a waggly tail, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, you know, I think that um, having 
support, whether it's, um, you know, something a teacher might put on your table or seat you on a wall where there's a big bank of words or having something from us or from somebody else that helps you with the vocabulary that you need is is going some way towards encouraging encouraging the child to you know put into on the page what they can put into words. Um, mm. It worries me a great deal when children stop writing, and it, I have to say it happens far too regularly. Which was one of the main kickers for us to do this. You know, we really wanted to help other children and who whose parents were perhaps you know we were lucky because we were both you know they were our third kids we'd been through the system we knew what was coming but you talk to parents who have just found out their first child is yeah. dyslexic and it's an absolute sort of you know um well I nearly swore then but it's a really <laughs> bad place to be in because they feel like they should do so much all the time they don't know what to prioritize and you know what works what doesn't work and what what the you know that the stress then gets put onto the child as well oftentimes yeah. you know so you know simple little hacks you know, <laughs> sorry beg the pun but you know it's really <laughs> really important because this is a journey i could see you yeah, I've always visualised they've got a pencil case stuffed there with all the pencils stuffed in the top and they just keep yanking them out to have a look, which <laughs> one is it this time? Mm. How did you come about all the graphics? Did you just end up testing a load? Because they're, they're really quite, I quite like them. They really explain what the word means in a very simple kind of way. And it's that, I'm, because I'm a geeky designer, really, I want to know how <laughs> the design process come around for them and how you managed to refine it down to the ones you've got. Uh, we had a brilliant illustrator, mm, yeah. um, <laughs> Amy Gallagher, and um, you know would suggest I would suggest what it could be, and she would quite often draw what I suggested and two or three others, and then we would just select from that really, you know whatever. Well, I think humour was important, yes. something that was yeah. humorous, that the kids would, you know, the right sort of tone, something that would attract their attention. You know, if you make something humorous, it becomes people are interacting with it, so you remember it more. So, you know, that was always a kind of a goal, just to keep it light and to keep it fun, but also, you know, yeah. actually, yeah. Mm. Did you do much testing to see which kind of graphics worked better? We were lucky because, you know, I teach dyslexic children mm. every day of the week. So um, we have our homegrown testing crowd that we can <laughs> work on. Um, and so that was really helpful. Yeah. So we, we got good feedback, you know, and that, that guided us a lot. But actually, to be honest, I think our instincts were quite good. I don't, we, I don't think we had to change anything in the end, did we? Everybody I think was there, fine. There was some prototype. When we were looking at the Bs and Ds, we went oh, through yes, that's right, yeah. prototype pencil toppers and things like that. And I was oh, yeah. making these sort of oh, one off yes, things right. and leave them. Sally would have them and try them with the kids. And um, <laughs> we ended up moving from that into tattoos and stickers for Bs yes, and Ds. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. So yeah. what, what do you got? Would you say tattoos? Well, you've got stickers on the back of their hands for which? Oh, well, the or stickers, how do they work? the stickers with um, for either left and right or and B and D, mm. and you can put them wherever you want. But they're also tattoos, which the the thinking was again this kind of like subtle reminder that you could have a tattoo that will be on for five days or something, and then you wash it off. Yeah, um, you know, and, and you can just put it. It was a B or a, or you know or a D. And and um, and we we had a little image of a bee and an image of a D for a dog. So it was a kind of like a nice little picture because tattoos mm. are kind of all the rage anyway, mm. aren't they? But these are ones that will wa wash off. Mm. <laughs> you yeah, your age roll yeah. with the permanent B on it. Anyway, um, so yeah, so yeah, it was a little just a little reminder, another visual reminder. Mm. Because um, one of my kids, when he was learning spelling, they did a whole thing in his class of, um, it was, they were doing a CH, they were learning CH. And yes. so the, the teacher was very inventive, actually made it very multisensory and had melted some chocolate and had suggested that they put their fingers in it and draw CH on each other's 
foreheads, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that that is had, quite creative. They had CH, and of course, it's not lovely. I don't know, they're licking their fingers, whatever. Yeah. But it was that sort of thinking. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, well, if it's on them, if it stayed on a bit longer, you know, then uh, it might, you might remember it. Mm. Kids do it naturally anyway. You know, they're, they dyslexic children have spotted everything in any classroom that's going to help them. They oh, yes. are really oh, yes. alert. I mean, you probably remember those days. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very, very clear to me, you know, when I, I've been a Senko in a school and you sit at the back and you watch the child that you're uh, there to, to observe and you see exactly where their eye line is going at what point and, you know, the, the cues that they're taking. And I remember from my first, um, in, when I was doing my teacher training, one, um, I was had a, my first dyslexic pupil, actually. I, I had to take him, they put us in the freezing cold loft, which was really nice and cozy. Yeah, how helpful. But, yeah. yeah, really cozy. Um, but we went up into the loft and it was really cold and he took his jumper off. And I thought, God, what's he taking his jumper off for? It's freezing up here. And then I'd asked him to spell his name and his name was Sam. <laughs> and he took his jumper off and he got his name that was on yeah, the back yeah. of his jumper. You know, his name was Sam. It was pretty pretty simple name really but you know he knew that that's how he was not going to get his name wrong and so you know I think kids are that dyslexic kids are smart they're ingenious they're looking for support and they'll find it in the classroom they'll find it anywhere um, nice. so you know let's put it where they don't have to hope that you know some, some big guy with a big big hairdo is not covering the words that they need for that day you know put it right in front of them yeah also got, i used to get told off for looking around the class as i'm finding mm -hmm. the, the i don't know the, not the cheat the workaround of well you know, i could see that sign out there that's got what one of the words i need on it and it's yeah mm -hmm. you just get told off for looking up like mm -hmm. yeah, that's really well, smart well. that's really problem yeah. solving but yeah, yeah the teacher yeah. possibly doesn't realize what you're doing no no i don't think so <laughs> And I wouldn't necessarily tell them what I was doing either. No, so, of course not. Because no, no. you want to fit in, don't you? Which is kind of That's your it. sort of drive as well. Yeah. How are teachers with this? Because they're obviously in a classroom. I, sh I get the feeling you're aiming more at primary and early secondary school kids. Would yeah. that be your kind of demographic? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the teachers that um, I work with and have spoken to just love it. They absolutely Good. love it. And they wish they had the budget to buy it for everybody. And they put posters up and things for us, which is very um, kind and supportive. I mean, I think any any sort of Senko or anybody who has dealt properly, you know, with dyslexic learners and know how the word some can drive them bonkers for three years um, <laughs> would love you know, that's just one of 240 that they actually have to nail, you know, by the end of year two, ideally, and sometimes yeah. go on to year six. So, you know, know that that's just, we, we don't, spelling's so not important, but it can have the most <laughs> awful effect if you don't feel it's, comfortable about it. It can be devastating, can't it? You mm. mocked T's on it, feel like oh. you don't fit in. Yes. And that's one thing I wanted to get to was exams. So. Mm. <laughs> you can't use our stuff in exams no I was about to say you can't take a pencil case with stuff written on it in exams no. can you <laughs> no sadly not but what's the prep for them to transition through from if they've been using more of the time so they're hitting their sats and they've been using for two three years yeah how well, do you after, transition after two through? or three years they would know it anyway they, they right. would know it okay. and we have sort of some teaching aids on the website that explain mm. in hopefully quite a friendly and fun way the, the some of the key rules that you need to get under your belt so you know by the time you have to sit your 11 plus for example um you you will know most of the words uh, if not all of the words that we put in front of you the the difficulty is you know you might be able to spell something fine for two days of the week and then you're a bit tired or you're thinking about the handwriting or the grammar or the vocabulary or something else and then your spelling goes out the window you know yep. so um it's really unfair for dyslexic children to be marked down on spelling and actually um you know in GCSEs now they only used to penalize you a few marks if your spelling was dodgy and that's doubled now, um, which is, you know, <laughs> shocking really for <laughs> children with a dyslexia diagnosis because that's 
feeding into the whole thing about, you know, I better write less in case I um, I spell it wrong. Well, you know, in your GCSE English, who wants to encourage a child to write less? It's That's just... Yeah. Uh, I, I, the big one example for me was my history exam. Mm-hmm. I, to this day, could tell you what happened in the Munich Putsch in Germany. Mm-hmm. I got a really poor grade in that exam that because it's an essay-based exam. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's, yeah, it, it's tricky with things like that. I, at university, I, by the time I got to university, late 20s, I was using scribes. Yes. So, you know, oh, did you? Was, right. Yeah. 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 And then you're getting told by the scribe to slow down because they can't keep up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, infuriating. Okay. Yeah. Well, I would sort of encourage you now, you know, um, teenagers to transition to laptops. I think most do mm, because mm. you know the the print that when you you bash the <laughs> bash the key, you're always going to get the same shape, and you know you have that visual constancy, which is really helpful. Whereas when you're writing, you know it, you can write things in a different way, and you won't necessarily spot it, but the computer will spot it for you if uh, you're yeah, using a laptop. Yeah. So um, it is a bit easier, I think, and especially although it's very very painful if you can get your typing speed up to quicker than you can write then you're on to a real winner and yes. you won't look back um i was to say the other thing with writing handwriting exams and probably just show my age because there was no we weren't allowed laptops in exams because they were no. huge um but over gripping the pen so i didn't want oh, fatigue yeah. after a while okay yeah <laughs> i have to say that you know with two of my sons that they did not take the uh, laptop option because they okay. felt they actually felt it affected their spelling. That that kind of kynesthetic, that motion, that hand, that movement was what helped them remember yes, how yeah, a word yeah. formed. Um, so for both of them, they they chose to write their essays. Oh, and they, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's you know they're all different, aren't they? They are all different. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, and. It is, and it's. There's got quite a lot of things which overlap. As each dyslexic person is slightly different, and you probably find, as we've alluded to, with trying to look around the room to find words that spell. I imagine when you're putting your your handy spelling in front of them, mm. you find some really interesting ways that somebody's using it that you've never thought of, maybe. Well, I think one of the nicest things we've done is um, the colouring in, the homophone mat, because, you know, whenever you take your kid to Pizza Express or something, you know, and they, they just get bored so quickly or, you know, if the pizza takes more than four seconds to arrive, you know, they love the colouring. I mean, my kids always were like asking for the crayons and drawing and everything. And so we thought um, that that would be something that, you know, would really um, be a lovely project because, as you say, the hand thing is quite funny the character and you've got loads and loads of homophones and it's sort of quite a little bit like the where's wally you know what's going on here what's going on there and you can color them all in yourself so um those have been really popular particularly on holidays um okay for people taking on holidays but i i i wish i'd have had that when i i you know like maggie i've got three boys they were always boisterous and noisy and couldn't wait very long for anything and just to give them something that they could just get there and chat over a bit of colouring. I mean, I just think it's so much better than being on screens at a dining table, to be honest, although I know that's the, that's the new way, but... Um, yeah, screens think, instead of airpods. Yeah, you just don't talk though, do you? They just, then the kids don't talk together. It's, um, I don't know, I'm old fashioned, but I, I, I sit at dining tables, I have a bit of a thing that, um, you know, if you want your kids to speak, uh, letting them onto a, a screen is is not really the best way to do that. Mm, no, 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 losing young children into my, well, even adults, like a, the, the call of your phone is hard work. So just go, mm. going over this hom- homophone map, what's it look like? Is the colouring just something you can do that's fun with it or does the colouring help learn the homophones? Well, you can. You can be a bit systematic about it. And there is a, on the website, it, it tells you how, you know, you can use certain colours for certain things. But the main thing is just to have a lot of fun with it. Mm. Um, it's already been organised for you in a way that similar um, patterns are together. Um, but 
primarily it's making children oh yes peak that's one of those words that I could trip up on because mm-hmm. it's got two spellings or I mean some of them were quite new to me actually I never thought of prince like a Prince Charming and prints like your footprints being a homophone until we actually were, you know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, of course it it's is. quite funny, isn't it? Yeah. Which ones? I mean, like, a little bit, it depends on your accent, but um, <laughs> I, I hope we've got the most. How many are there, Maggie? Is, is there 50? 50, 50, yeah. I thought it was 50. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think um, one of the key things for, for kids to, you know, in terms of making something memorable is to present it over and over again, but in a variety of ways. So, yeah, yeah. you know, the fact that it's on a pencil is one way of interacting with it. The fact it's on a, in a homophone colouring pad is another way of interacting with it. You can colour it in. And also, you know, we've also have them on bookmarks, so you can, it's like a little visual reminder in your book, in your book you know. So it's, it's about putting it in a, a range of places and spaces so that it's being repeated isn't it? It's that kind of yes, just building yeah. it up, building it up, getting it from short term to long term memory just by that kind of oh here it is again. Oh, it's like this now, <laughs> you know. Yes. And parents yeah. can do that as well, much easier. I mean, you need our stuff sort of thing for school where parents can't get in there, you know, and, and try mm. and, and control the situation. But you know, at <laughs> home you can get those um I, I love those pens that restaurants use. You know, you can buy them now and then write on the the mirror in the bathroom. Oh, you or, mean the chalk markers? You know, the, yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. In the foam in the bar. You know, as Maggie says, it's the variety of ways of engaging um, uh, students. You never know which one is going to kick mm. in at which point. So I would really encourage parents to be as creative at home as possible. I remember when, I still remember when my son said to me, mum, why is mechanic not mechanic if that's how he spells it? <laughs> and I was like, yes, <laughs> something's sticking, you know, even though it was quite hard to explain. I was like, yes, you're right. That should be a CH, you know. And yeah. For a dyslexic yeah. child to look at some you know, lorry and work out that mechanic was spelt strangely. I, I thought I'd done quite a good job in that instance. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always joke with people, I used to work as a mechanic and then I work as an engineer and I got a fancier job with an easier word to spell. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. It's exactly. Worth, worth a degree. Uh, H- HDB technician. Why does technician look really wrong? <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so, yeah, parents can really play around with all of that stuff at home, in a, mm-hmm. you know, to make those patterns uh, stick out. Because otherwise, you know, if you don't see it regularly, you are never, as a dyslexic person, going to um, just naturally work out that there's this sound in this word or this sound and that you can't hear it. You know, it's mad. No. Did you find something I used to do when I was younger, like, I could commit certain words to short-term memory to get through whichever bit of the topic I need to get through that point. And then mm. it went again. <laughs> yeah, of course. Mm. Yeah. Of yeah. course, because we don't have a, a clear mapping of sound to letter in our language. So, you know, that's definitely going to, yeah, if you're doing the Egyptians, you know, you've got the egg whip and the papyrus and all of those words and then three days later you don't need them anymore and then that's gone but yeah I think that's very common very very common I I, to be honest with you I always think it's absolutely amazing that anybody can look at our language start reading and then just know how to spell I mean how do people who are not dyslexic do that I, it's I such don't a know. strange language, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, it's such yeah. a strange language. Yeah. How do you just read it, see a word a few times, and then know when you happen to want to spell it a year later that it's got a T in it or whatever? I mean, it is unbelievable given the, the strangeness of our language. Yeah, the old classic, look, cover, write, check. It's like yeah. Did, yeah. yeah, people seem yeah. to be able to do that three times. and like, got it. Yeah, it does yeah. not work for dyslexics at all. No, yeah. no, not at all. And it's... Very condescending oh, when somebody tells you to keep light. doing it. Yeah, yeah. they still yeah. do that, Matt. Today, yeah, I do. That's I still going do. on, yeah. infuriatingly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, was, yeah. I just have a memory of a, a, a person in my class. She was being trying to be really helpful, but it's just this, this, this. Don't you think I've done that lots of times already? <laughs> like, I haven't just not bothered. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 
Um, no, it's a very difficult language. We don't have enough letters and, you know, we've been, it's a very old language. We've been invaded lots of times. The Vikings have caused us quite a few problems. The French, Julius Caesar, you know, so many, we, historically our language has been really um, messed around with. And then, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't spell like it sounds, that's for sure. Yes. So if somebody's listened to this, and wants to buy their children handy spelling, or even themselves, because they think it's fun. What is sort of the starter kit? What's the minimum amount you think they should get to kick them off with it, see if it's all for them? Um, I suppose it depends. You know, I think the ruler is a key thing. If you Mm -hmm. are in the kind of lower school and, that you know, writing the date is a feature every single day because, you know, and if you're going to, use the ruler that you usually start writing with pencils so you know the kind of yeah I mean the 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 pencils cover three different things basically that there are there's tricky words so the kind of the words that uh you're supposed to just remember just by seeing them so they're they're on the green pencil we've also got a range of pencils which actually help expand your vocabulary so, which are probably, I suppose, maybe slightly older, but, you know, if your teacher says to you, oh, can you think of a better word than said, then it says said at the top and there are suggestions as to what else you could use. Oh, uh-huh. almost like a thesaurus, but on a pencil. Yes, yes. The, yeah, yeah, the vocabulary pencils. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's nice, all those kind of words and then what's a better version. Mm-hmm. So there's also grammar pencils. Mm-hmm. Okay. Children are asked now... Um, very much part of the curriculum is to be quite detailed on your knowledge of grammar and you know those words the labels that we give like verb and noun they are you know very hard to remember what they relate to for people who are not dyslexic actually um as well as dyslexic children you know they've both got four letters they don't sound like anything else they don't give you any hint to what they what they represent you learn them only in this context so it's like is the verb the thing and the noun is the doing word you know people get them confused for a long time and you're asked from quite early on to be able to spot the noun in the phrase write the noun phrase you know uh is the verb in the past tense it's it's much earlier than it ever used to be all of this um specific grammatical knowledge and a dyslexic child could easily find the answer if they knew which one they were actually looking for so you know we have uh i i think that i'm very proud of the box um, that has the mixture in it has one of every pencil so by that you would get uh, a few synonyms for the high frequency words you'd get the tricky the, the first set of tricky ones and then you've got verbs adverbs nouns um adjectives um and you know it's it's a real good st- i think that's the best starter box myself but i guess it depends what you're after really what your particular um, okay. area is and are you thinking of exp- where are you thinking of expanding this to? How are you? Like, I almost amusedly thought, oh, I wonder what the adult version is look like and how much fun you could have with doing stuff you can't do for children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd have to be like a laptop cover or the back of your phone be, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it'd look more like a Parker pen rather than a pencil or something. But yeah. having, having something adult ba- based on it rather than children based it could be could have lots of fun. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, there's, you know, never ending um, desire for stationery in young people, in my opinion, you know, they absolutely love um, all of their bits and pieces. And of course, they're relatively cheap, which is really lovely for the parents. Um, So, you know, we have lots of ideas about where to go next, but uh, Mm -hmm. probably should work on them a bit more. I mean, there, there's there's potential to use the you know the artwork we've got on on a, a whole multitude of things actually. Yeah. You know, the idea of putting something in a, numerous places just so that it helps you remember it could be expanded into. I mean, we've talked about it. We haven't done it because basically we would need to reach a bigger audience before we do anything like that. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, you, you, we we could put it on furnishings, kids' furnishings. You could put it on, you know, on their curtains, on their duvet covers on there you know because they're kind of <laughs> they're kind of fun little characters you know yeah. um or you know we could create card games using the homophone 
pairs game you know there's you know it, it, you could play with it in that sense um we've talked about pencil cases definitely posters you know it's quite easy to extend it really but we do need to um reach more people before we do that because we've already got an amount of stuff and uh as Sally yes. says, when people know about it they love it um but it's just about you know we're a tiny company it's just about trying to grow an audience and if people like it which they do seem to then you know it encourages us to move forward with it really how uh, are you trying to get it into schools are you just basically going around with it and on a <laughs> show and tell and sort of assembly all the time or what's your sort of strategies for getting it far and wide well it's been interesting because we only started in lockdown so mm, there were mm. there were no schools and yes, of course. yeah <laughs> And uh, what we started with was, of course, you know, people suddenly found themselves at home with their kids and uh, we produced a lot of free resources that could be downloaded to kind of give a structure. Yeah. No, we do, but I guess the main the thing that we should do more of is uh, approach Senkos um, because they're the ones that see the real value of it. Um you know, I think normal teachers just think, oh, that's really nice. But, you know, it's just more pencils. We've got pencils of all shapes and sizes and everything. But um, yes. Senkos go, oh, I see. Um, <laughs> you know, and it's that we, we think 10% of the population are dyslexic. I, I think it's more, but maybe that's just because of the world I live in. Everybody I meet <laughs> seems to be dyslexic. But, you know, um, it's for a particular sort of child that they will be helped by it but obviously I mean the grammar ones help everybody you know who's just not quite reached that stage and and yeah. not, the honest truth is that lots of people have a delay as well with spelling because it is so weird so you may be quite um and it's not that common but you might be quite a funky speller until you're about eight or nine and then it all just clicks you know, that's, that does happen, and they're not dyslexic at all, but they look like they were going to be. Um, yeah. Or children who are learning English as a foreign language or as a second language or a third language, you know, um, it's just about support. Um, we should be doing more um, about schools. We're both quite busy, um, so, you know, we do what we can. Um, yeah, we I have recently given it to some local schools, actually, with, yeah. you know, given them free stuff, just just uh hoping you know to get some feedback from them mm. um but that's a sort of ongoing situation mm. actually it's parents of dyslexic children who are absolutely looking for something and see immediately you know when they've tried to teach their child the difference between does and knows for you know that week's spellings and just realized it doesn't make any sense how am I going to teach this what's going you know this is going to I don't know why children have to get marks for their spellings, actually. You know, they're so fixated with, I got four out of ten or so-and-so got ten out of ten. It's it's such a terrible sort of precedent to set, you know, that everybody knows and is judged on that because probably the child who got four out of ten put so much more effort in. I know. Yeah, that's the thing for me. It's the self-esteem. And if the self-esteem is damaged when you're young, it's just, I mean, school is like a survival course isn't it mm. for kids with dyslexia to try and yeah. get through yeah. and not be damaged is such a feat and you know all of my children have left school now one's at university but I'm so glad it was like mm. what an endurance test that was you know mm. parents have to fight their corner all the way <laughs> you know it is a mission isn't it and um just to try and protect some of that self-esteem just so that you feel a little bit supported Mm. it's hard work being the parent of dyslexic children and I think unless you're in that club yeah. you you don't get that and maybe you know you asked at the beginning how we became friends you know you're in that club and you sort yeah. of know you yeah have you know. those moments you know I've been asked for a child to leave to have to leave his school you know that was devastating yeah. Um, yeah. you know with various you know the, dis- the endless disappointments in this system but your faith in your child that they are wonderful and have yeah. so much to offer and yeah. uh, actually as you know Maggie's children are uh, a bit older and have gone on to do amazingly well but you know school making you feel like what is gonna what is gonna happen because they're not hitting these marks um yeah. You know, yeah. I, I would really like all parents of dyslexic children to 
be able to put school in some sort of perspective and, and look at the future, but it's very hard when you're in it. It's really, it's really, really hard tough. when you're in it, which yeah. is also why, you know, like I said earlier, I think that sort of superpower kind of message has, has a place, but it, it is a kind of a glossing over at the same mm. time of how mm. kids are actually experiencing things right mm. now. You know, yeah. it doesn't I feel like a more power when you are, no. you know, yeah. Yeah. struggling. Yeah. It doesn't feel like that. No. So uh, although it's aspirational and great to hear of all these people that do great things, hmm. it, the reality day to day can be really hmm. quite hard. You know? yes, I never use that. I never, I absolutely agree with you. I always say, you know, chances are it's going to be really hard work until you get to GCSEs and then hmm. you can choose your mm. A-level subjects that are more suited to the way your brain works. And if you mm. prepare yourself that it's going to be quite challenging, you probably get told around the age of seven or eight, something like that. And then until the age of 16, you know, you've probably got eight quite demanding years. And if you don't, great, that's wonderful. But if you're prepared, I think it is better than giving this false hope because it's, that, it's treating dyslexic people as if they're stupid. You know, I'm, mm. they know what are you talking about my superpower I, it's I, I don't like it at all it's it's an interesting and you know, I've had a few conversations with people on the superpower thing and it's <laughs> when you it, it's tricky because I'm one of my 30 well coming up 38 in a month so yes I can step into that and I've got a job and a creative uh, occupation that keep, keeps me using that and I'm like oh yes and we've with guests of this podcast, you pull things out that is their dyslexic strength, I think is probably mm. a, a mm. nice way of putting it. So, like, mm. your dyslexic strength comes out. And there's a concept, uh, I, and I, I wish I could attribute this to the person I've heard it from, but I've forgotten. Shadow of the strength, where you are really good at one thing, but that cast a shadow, which is kind of mm. the things that you, you either overdo the strength or you're not as good at something else. It's kind of all that balance in the world. Yeah. And I, I do, if, if I had to tell the 10-year-old me that they had a superpower, he wouldn't have found that very helpful at all. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, really. It, you obviously deal with children more than I do, and clearly you think it's slightly off. I think, but... it, I think largely it's disingenuous. They don't feel like they have one. And so you keep telling them you have this superpower, I think, puts you at a disconnect I think you have to be very very honest uh, having said that I think there are some great advantages to being dyslexic which when you finish with your GCSEs with a lot of subjects that you perhaps are not suited to or yeah. when you leave school altogether then you know I do think there are phenomenal advantages to being dyslexic not least because you've worked for the last eight years harder than anybody else <laughs> and have worked out how you yeah. learn how your brain works how to communicate you know your eq as well as your iq and as we know there is an enormous amount of talent in the creative industries in anything with 3d there's a lot of advantages to being dyslexic but i think up until gcse it's it's not necessarily an easy ride yeah yes yeah. Um, it is, is it? It's tricky. I mean, maybe if it, if it is a superpower and it's like Superman, then until the end of your GCCs, you're on Krypton, where yeah. everybody's, everybody's <laughs> yes, the same. You know you <laughs> and it's only That's with, the way after, to do it. Yeah, yeah you get gone to wow. Earth after GCCs. You're like, wow, hang on, what the hell's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. Think, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's interesting. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to start rounding out the podcast now. I have some... Rap, three rapid fire questions I ask every guest in the podcast. Now, there's two of you, and I'm not quite sure how this is going to work, but I'm going to do it. Anyway. <laughs> so, they're rapid fire from me. They don't need quick answers from you, though. So, let's start with question number one, and I'm going to get Maggie to answer this first, and then Sally can jump in. So, question number one is What prejudice have you had about dyslexia that's been proven wrong? Prejudice that I've had about dyslexia? Yes. Oh. Prejudice I've had about dyslexia. Oh, I really, I mean, all I can think actually is that when I was told my child was dyslexic, it was given to me as a very negative thing. Mm. And I went to a bookshop trying to find out something about it. And I looked at all these books and they all seemed to be prejudiced, um, <laughs> apart from one, which was called The Gift of Dyslexia. 
And that was the book that I bought. Mm. Uh, by Ronald Davis. Probably. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I don't know if that's the answer to the question, but yeah, no, um, I, I felt no there were a here. lot of prejudices. Uh, <laughs> This was this was the thing that I was trying to avoid it. I was trying to avoid the prejudice. I was looking for the positive and I went for the gift of dyslexia. Mm. Yeah, good, good. And Sally? I think that um, I had in my mind that dyslexia was a problem with spelling, but also and primarily with reading. Mm. And I think actually a lot of dyslexics, the vast majority of dyslexics um, with repeated reading actually catch up with reading rather quickly um whereas spelling can be a lifelong nightmare um yeah, but yeah. i think dyslexics can actually learn how to read as fluently and accurately as their non-dyslexic peers quite quickly two years worth of quite concentrated reading um and actually that's so much more important because if you can't read the um curriculum really does close down whereas if you can't spell and you can either find a technique for spelling or you can get your head around the fact that you just don't care about your spelling then you can just embrace any subject regardless so um yeah i i i thought it was going reading was going to be equally as difficult if not more than spelling and i don't think that's the case yes yes because reading allows you to acquire a lot of knowledge Yes, I think yeah. actually in that in that context, then I probably never thought that my son would go on to study history, mm. <laughs> degree mm. in history, which mm. was an intense amount of reading, an intense amount of writing, mm. and come out with the first. Mm. I oh. wonderful. Yeah. Never in a thousand years would I have thought that after mm. as we battled through primary school. Yeah, oh, that, that's got to feel really rewarding when, mm-hmm. when yeah. you're still at graduation. And yeah. actually, you got my juices going now, but I, <laughs> I, I remember thinking, oh, we are not going to make it through school. I mean, yeah. it was made so, it was so yeah. brutal in those yeah. early years, you know, and yeah. it was like, um, I remember I, at one point I had to get my mum to go and pick my son up from school because every day the teacher would say, we've learned absolutely nothing today. He hasn't paid attention for one single minute. Oh, God, and I just time. couldn't. I just couldn't listen to it. You know, with, you, this is like the little person that you love more than anything on the planet. Mm, mm. And you've got somebody just, dishing out this negativity in on a daily basis in front of and overheard by all the other mothers of all the other children I couldn't do it 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 was reduced me to tears every day so my mum used to go and pick him up because I I couldn't listen to that oh. yeah yes and of course it was nonsense yeah so well yes yes <laughs> but that's not not fun and I hadn't really no. thought of it from the no. Well, I had thought, uh, yeah, I kind of know it from my mum's point of view, but I hadn't thought, put that much thought into it until you'd uh, mentioned that. <laughs> yeah, ask your mum. I bet she had a real, you know, she was worried about you a lot, I bet. Mm, yeah, mm. that or my younger brother who was doing other things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my second rapid fire question, and I think I could let Sally answer this first, um, is if an alien come down and landed and you had to describe dyslexia to them, how would you do it? Oh, I'd be quite boring, I'm afraid. And I'd just say, <laughs> just, uh, I'd say it was a problem matching how words sound to how you have to spell them. And um, with an associated problem with organising in the early years. Mm. I, I'm sorry, I'm that's sort of quite a traditional definition. No? But I think it does. That, that's what comes into my mind cool maggie um i would say to the aliens that (laughs) there are different ways of learning and that our education system is very geared towards one way of learning Um, but there are lots of people that like to learn in different ways and they like to learn by seeing and hearing and feeling and touching Um, and unfortunately not all schools do that Mm. so Mm. therefore some children find it difficult. Yes. Okay. And the very last question of this podcast, and you're not allowed to answer with by handy spelling. But seeing as this is the Dyslexia Life Hack show, what is your favorite dyslexia life hack? 
Um, I, I like... Um, I like the idea that if you're very forgetful, which my boys are, there's something you have to remember for the following morning is that you write it down, you stick it in your shoe. Your so shoe. That when okay. You stick it in your shoe the night before. So it means that you can't leave the house without you, you put on you put on your shoe and you see it in there. You go, mm. oh, I've got to do the thing. I've got to print the thing or get that uh, thing or you see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, because I can't trust the morning me, so I have everything prepped. Tonight, exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. So it's to just give yourself a reminder, put it in a place where you can't, you know, ignore it, basically. So if it's in your shoe, then you're walking out the door. Unless you're the kind of person who forgets your shoes, then. Yeah. <laughs> I've got hope for you then. <laughs> I walked around for three hours and think, damn, these shoes are uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, exactly. I've got something in my shoe. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, for me, it would have to be uh, audio books or reading to your child. Um, I know that's quite traditional, but the fact that you can uh, have a love of and an understanding of literature, words, expression, communication, um, creative writing, I think when you feel strong in that area, if you're the child, I teach a girl who writes the most remarkable stories, not a single word with the exception of A is spelled Hmm. correctly, but they are hands down the most creative stories that anybody I teach uh, writes. Hmm. And she knows it. She knows and it has actually made the fact that her spelling is weak. She doesn't really care because she knows that she's using all this wonderful imagery and her setting and her characters and her vocabulary. And that comes from reading. That comes from either somebody reading to you or I think, you know, let Stephen Fry do it. But, you know, (laughs) getting audible or uh, tapes, you know, lots of people are getting rid of their CDs uh, in the charity shops. Really, you know, you can pick up loads. The more you become an expert in language, it, the spelling is the least important part of language. So, you know, feed comprehension, feed creativity, feed imagination and expression. And then actually, you know, if somebody has to say you've missed an E off here or there's a silent letter in there, it doesn't matter. Whereas other people can't come up with that amazing simile because they're just not quite as um, exposed to language. So I, I think the whole turning what's important about literacy on its head is is quite important. Okay. Well, I want to thank you guys for taking the time to come on the show. And where can people find Handy Spelling or get hold of you to find out more? Well, we have a website. Mm-hmm. Um, it's www.handyspelling.com. And you'll find all the stuff we talked about is there and lots of free stuff to download. Um, yeah. And we're on Instagram. Oof. Yeah, we're on Instagram. Yeah. Just Instagram? We're on Facebook and everywhere else too. Uh, yeah, we're on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay then I will... Instagram is the is the active account. Yeah. Okay, and I will link to them in the show notes, uh, you. so you thank can you. find them there. And I want to thank you again for taking the time to come on, and I want to thank everybody else for taking the time to listen. And I will thank see you. you guys in the next episode. Goodbye for now. <laughs>